From In the Beginning to the Musical Apocalypse, this is The Bible Says What. I'm your host, Mike Wiseman. Greetings, BSW heathens. The t-shirt giveaway is still ongoing. We are just 10 patrons away from reaching the goal. Once the show reaches 25 patrons, I will pick a patron at random and send them a Bible Says What t-shirt. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash BSW the podcast and sign up to be a supporter of the show. Your episodic tithes of a dollar or more will give you a chance to win prizes, gain early access to each episode, listen to unaired conversations, and unlock the patron feed. That being said, when we suffer a loss or hardship, most of us will attempt to keep a positive attitude and deal with the issues we are presented with. Sometimes these hardships are too much for our minds to handle. We need help getting through some of the more challenging facts of life, such as suffering and death. These things can be very difficult to go through on your own. That's where the mental health workers play an important role. We need to put our trust in people that want to help us, real flesh and blood humans. When we put our hopes and mental health in the hands of an invisible mute being, we've done nothing to actually deal with the presenting issues. Brushing it under the rug, sitting it at the feet of Jesus, or wishing upon a star all have the same probability of producing a result. To make matters worse for the believer, most assume these hardships are divinely inspired. A lot of Christians claim their deity has in the past or is currently causing or allowing them to experience pain and suffering. Yahweh wants them to endure hardship like a good Christian soldier, 2 Timothy 2, 3. The perfect Christian deity believes that slaves should submit to their masters, even those who are harsh, for it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, 1 Peter 2, 18 and 19. He wants his followers to join in suffering for the gospel, 2 Timothy 1, 8. According to 1 Peter 3, 17, it is better if it is Yahweh's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. If Yahweh Yahweh wants you to be in agony and distress, you don't get a choice. This is all part of his perfect plan. A man may plan his course, but Yahweh determines his steps. Proverbs 16, 9. Why would anyone want to worship such a monster? Let's start the show. Is there anything in the Bible that you yourself have an issue with? <laughs> Okay, so it took you reading the Bible to realize that those things were bad for you? Yeah, it actually did. I, I didn't you figure this out on your own? No, Ted, Ted Bundy could be redeemed. God doesn't kill children. Does, what do you think the Passover was? Yahweh sets up a whole system in the Old Testament where you slaughter animals just so he's able to forgive you. Today's special guest is author of Laugh Like a Kid Again and other books, uh, Phil Calloway. Welcome to the show, Phil. Hey, great to be with you, Mike. Why don't you tell us a little bit about all those books you've written? Oh, man, I started writing <laughs> back in the early 90s. And uh, I was asked to write, you know, serious stuff for columns on family because I had three little kids and I had to know everything about kids. I mm. must, if I had that many children, uh, be an expert. Uh, but <laughs> I, it scared me to death to write about my family because I knew I was no, you know, in those days, no Dr. Dobson, no Dr. Phil. Mm. And uh, so my wife said to me, just tell stories and make us laugh. Tell us there's hope. Hmm. And so that's what I've been doing. So I have written, I am told, 27 or 28 books. Um, and some of them related to child rearing, a lot of them about, you know, kind of dealing with difficulty in life. And uh, golf books, all kinds of stuff. And I just have uh, two brand new ones out in the last couple of months. So That's amazing. You just can't stop writing. Just keeps going, huh? Can't stop writing. And, you know, thankfully publishers keep asking me, for them, so they <laughs> they do well enough to to keep them interested. And, uh, That's good. Yeah, I, you know the coolest stuff is to get. I I just had uh, five minutes ago a note from a lady that just said your your two books. One was called Laughing Matters, and then this Laugh Like a Kid Again have, are getting us through um, chemo. My husband is not doing all that well, but mm -hmm. uh, when we read what you're writing, it it really helps us, and so. Uh, that's, yeah, that's as good as it gets for me. I, that thrills me. 
That's that's well, you, laughter, you know, is the best medicine. So, I agree. That's that's very helpful sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and I I think I I didn't understand that early on, Mike. I I just um, I, laughter was a part of my home, though my mother was severely depressed. Hmm. Um, I learned from my dad how to make her laugh and would do that. I, I was just four or five, they tell me, when I would go into her room and uh, she would be in, in bed. I just, my mom was sick. That's all I knew. You know, they mm. didn't use the D word, uh, depression. And uh, so I would cheer her up, make her laugh, and she'd go out to the kitchen and make me breakfast. And so it was my first paying gig. Um, <laughs> but in time, you know, you know, I found that there was a way to to make a living at something that I got in trouble for throughout school, uh, making others laugh. Hmm. And then, then we had hard stuff come into our lives, so it all took a turn. But, um, you know, it's, um, a lot of listeners today would say, yeah, I haven't been doing a whole lot of laughing lately, and hopefully, hopefully we'll do some of that today. Hmm. Do you think he always has a sense of humor? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, you know that's that's such a great question because I um I have a letter here. It's uh, about two and a half pages long from California. Um, somebody just basically saying to me, you know, there is no record of Jesus laughing. Hmm. Um, why do you? Um, and it's uh, you know obviously there are a lot more components to it than that, but I, <laughs> you know. So I, I don't know. I I grew up in a pretty conservative church where there wasn't a whole lot of laughter, mm. and so I figured that God wasn't um, really into it either. And so you know, you had us singing. I, I'm old enough to remember a song. You know, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. <laughs> where and they would sing, where <laughs> you know, down in down in my heart, where. Yeah, yeah. And I thought later, I thought, man. They had to keep asking because they couldn't find it. And I thought Joyful Christian was an oxymoron like Jumbo Shrimp and, and Military Intelligence and Microsoft Works. Um, turns out that the people who have impacted me the most have been you know, some, some great theologians, for one thing. I know even Oswald Chambers was constantly um, uh, told off for his sense of humor. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was spurned by many for his sense of humor. Hmm. Um, but I, you know, that's maybe not, not answering, excuse me, <laughs> not answering your question, Mike. No, I know theologians, I know theologians aren't humorous, but how about Galway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I, you know, um, David A. Peters is a writer who, uh, he counts more than a thousand humorous lines and stories in the Bible. Hmm. Um, so, you know, for example, you have, what is it, uh, 1 Kings 18 or so, that Elijah is facing off with the priest of Baal, you know, to prove whose God is stronger, and Baal doesn't react to the prayers of his priests, not surprisingly, but uh, Elijah basically says, pray louder, and, and he says in, in two different translations, uh, pretty similar to this, you know, maybe... Bale is taking a nap, maybe he's away on vacation, maybe he's sitting on the toilet, uh, <laughs> which is, you know, that's story, but that's what he said. And so, you know, Elijah was one of the first stand-up comics to ridicule his audience, I think. Um, you fast forward to Acts 12, uh, Peter gets tossed in jail, an angel shows up, you know the story, sets him free. Hmm. And immediately Peter heads over to a house where a group of believers is gathered, and uh, they're praying for his release, knocks on the gate, Rhoda, the servant girl, answers, recognizes Peter's voice, gets so excited, she forgets to open the gate, runs off to tell the prayer group, which I, you know, I read these things, and I um, I was reading something else this morning, it just made me kind of laugh, because here he is, you know, they're praying for his mm-hmm. release, and they won't believe her when, when she tells them, well, the guy's right out there, and, and they can't they can't believe this. Um Peter stands outside, he's, you know, basically, hey, guys, it's me, stop praying, you know, <laughs> let me in. Um, there are, you know, there are all kinds of instances where you have, uh, in, in fact, Genesis 17, God speaking to Abraham, you're going to be a father, Abraham, uh, you know, basically fell on his face and laughed, hmm. you know, where they say, uh, rolling on the floor laughing, R-O-T-F-L, 
textures would say. Um, <laughs> Hebrews 11 later comments, I like this, on Abraham's age when he became a father, says he was, quote, as good as dead. Um, <laughs> that's pretty good. You know, Sarah hears the news, she laughs out loud. You know, God um, got mad about that, though. Know. He sure did. Yeah, don't yeah. laugh at me. I and said, I'm going to give you a kid. You're going to like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then she names she names him the kid, names him Isaac, um, mm-hmm. Hebrew for laughter. Hmm. And Sarah says, God has made me laugh, hmm. and everyone who hears of this uh, will laugh with me. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I mean, the Bible mm-hmm. contains tragedy and sorrow and abundance. Um, it, hmm. it does say Yahweh... Yeah, uh, basically scoffed, laughed at how, uh, is it Psalm 2 or so, where it's, you know, the one sits in, in the heavens last, but he's laughing. It's it's really a kind of a laughter of, of derision where where he's saying, you know, basically the nations think they're so big and so wonderful. Um, they're not, and he laughs. Uh, hmm. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I, you know, I, I think... I, I think you'd be hard pressed to argue that the backdrop of Scripture is not one of triumphant joy. You know, um, it contains mm. tragedy and sorrow and abundance. And, and this lady uh, was right that that wrote me. You know about you know, you know God doesn't no record of God laughing and all. Um, but it, it's it's clear that Jesus said, "In this world you will have trouble, but be of good mm. cheer. I have overcome the world." which is something mm. we we desperately need to hold on to right now in the midst of COVID and all. Um, he didn't say be of good fear. He said be of good cheer. Well, he and did say fear him a lot. I mean, to be fair, he, he, he does want you to fear him. He does, absolutely. Fear yeah. God, but um, he's, he's saying, I mean, Jesus has said, is not saying to fear God at that point. He's talking about, you know, mm. uh, not not to be be fearful of uh, that he has overcome the world um so yeah we're to fear god i think and fear you know when we truly do fear him we we don't fear uh, hmm. the things that, that everyone else is fearing in an anxious world so um, do you do you, as a father i know you, you said you were a father as well would do you want your kids to fear you would you tell them that the that the fear of me is the beginning of wisdom and understanding I tried that on them, and uh, <laughs> not certain how it went. <laughs> um, uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think we've maybe taken that out of parenting completely, where uh, we're, they don't fear any type of discipline. Boy, if you don't smart up, I'm going to give you a time out hmm. for three days. Um, <laughs> you know, when I grew up, it was more of a, you you just wait till your father gets home. The worst yeah. words a mother ever spoke. Seriously, um, yeah. Because yeah. they definitely there was. I, I knew that there was pain involved in going over across a, you know across a certain line. Hmm. Um, I you know my par- my kids are older now, so I, I don't think they fear their dad. It'd be so an interesting question you. to ask them. Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, you better get on that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, three in three years. Um, the Holy anesthetic cow. was still working for the first, uh, you know, for the third birth from the first good, birth. Good grief! And man. Uh, somebody said to me, "What's it like to have three kids in three years?" I said, "Well, we're far more satisfied than the guy who has three million dollars." And they said, "Well, how so?" Hmm. And I said, "Well, the guy with three million wants more." Um, <laughs> but we, yeah, that joke. <laughs> it works, uh, yeah, it we're works. very thankful for them. And suddenly, Mike, we've got thirteen grandkids. Um, <laughs> wow! It's just absolutely nuts. And you talk about, you know, did, I mean, kids—they have a sense of humor right from the start. Certain things they'll say make you laugh. Yeah. And uh, where does where does that come from? I, you know, I I I grew up mm. thinking that a sense of humor came from the enemy of our souls. You know, Satan. Maybe that wow. was it. Um, but I think you know, practical theology tells me that over and over I have watched humor build people up. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it can do the opposite. You, you and I both have witnessed that, where you know, rotten humor can drag people down and, and ridicule them and all. So I'm not talking about that kind of humor. 
But hmm. I have seen people, you know, after um, comedy events that I do come up to me, and, and what I do is I use comedy to tell people of the only reason that I'm alive, and that is Christ. And so a lot of people come up to me and they will say this invariably. Um, I, I have not, thank you, I have not laughed since, you know, April hmm. 4th. Yeah, yeah. And I'll say, well, what happened April 4th? Hmm. And they'll say, well, you know, my son took his life. Or they will mention to me the most horrible event of their lives and thank me for, you know, I think God-honoring humor. But it's hmm. remind them, as humor tends to do, that we, you know, because we're a little bit out of control when we're laughing. Well, yeah, laughter we is, that, you know, right. It's, it's pleasurable. It makes us feel better. Um, I, I, you know, I sure. can't go with the whole losing a, a kid park. That that's horrible. But I can, you know, like the other day, you know, I just wasn't feeling it. I wasn't. I was. I had been through a lot. It's been pretty stressful, and I wasn't really humorous. So I was just kind of down. And then I watched this TV show, uh, Miracle Workers. I think it's called on HBO Max. Funniest thing I've seen in a long time. Man, I couldn't stop laughing, and that immediately brought yeah. my spirits back up, and I, I'm back to normal again. So it just it takes laughter. Laughter definitely is a great medicine because it makes us happy. So I agree. But yeah. so we would have to. Sorry. No, but when you add the the extra, God is the one that's uh, giving them this laughter and whatnot, and uh, making them feel better. Is, is that what you're asserting here? That, that God's the one that's using your laughter to help them? I think so. Um, hmm. You know, I, I've seen, I've talked, I've been with comedians who use it for a very different purpose, hmm. and we've had discussions about this. Um, you know, one guy was telling me, well, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to have audiences like you do where you're talking about God. Like, how do you do that? Because God is a big part of my life. And I say, well, it, it's not an add-on. It's just part of what I do. And so I, I remember saying to one guy, I said, well, so have, has your wife heard your act? And he said, yeah. And, and <laughs> I said, oh, what does she think? And he said, well, she hates it. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's maybe where you want to start, is that you, you, can't, you can't go from making your wife look like a complete idiot to mm. go into tell, to, and then transition into, oh, God has done such great things in my life, because I'm sitting there thinking, well, if God's done great things in your life, the first thing he needs to do right now is get you and your wife squared away. <laughs> um, I'd like to know about that. I'd like to hear how that works. Hmm. I was speaking to 500 women uh, in Niagara Falls, not in the Falls, but um, in a hotel at a ladies' conference. Mm -hmm. On the Sunday morning, I'm up at the front, and um, I saw a guy come in. So there were three guys. There was a guy, I think, doing the sound or something. And this guy came in, and he just sat at the back. And afterwards, he came up to me. He says to me, um, I play in the bar band. It was the Sheraton Hotel there. He said, I play in the bar band, and um, so I played till 2 in the morning, and I slept for a while, I got up this morning. I came down here, and I heard all these women laughing, and I thought, what in the world is that about? So he said, I, I came into the room, and they let me in, and he had taken all these notes, and he said to me, uh, look at this. He had written down these um, scripture references, and then stuff about, I was talking about learning to laugh when life stinks was my topic. Hmm. And he said, um, my parents in Boston have been praying for years that I would come home to Jesus, and that's what happened this morning. And I thought, well, you know, that never would have happened had he not heard this laughter. I think most people that I meet um, they don't necessarily want to hear about my faith at the start of mm. conversations we'll have. But when they laugh, everything changes. I saw that uh, two days before we had this lockdown, um, talking with a woman on the plane who just told me, you know, I, I grew up in church and it was a miserable experience. And here I am and we're starting to laugh. Mm. And we got talking about God's grace. And God transformed her life, not because I'm wonderful in any way, but God used that time 
together where I made her laugh and she told me I never would have. She, she wrote me later to say this never would have happened hmm. if you wouldn't have made me laugh. Well, she doesn't know that, but laughter definitely uh, breaks down walls. Uh, it loosens people up. Absolutely. What, what That's... she was saying, though, Mike, hmm. yeah, what she was saying was our conversation would have ended much earlier. I would not have gone as far in this conversation. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, she was, As soon as she found out I was a Christian, she did what many others do. And she said, you know, some say I used to be a Christian. A bunch of them have said to me, I've had bad experiences with Christians. To which I always reply, me too, you know? <laughs> and that's what I did with her. And she Bad started experiences to laugh. With, with people, I think that's, you know, it's not just Christians, it's not, it's not specific. It's just, Absolutely. We, we have bad experiences with people, for sure. <clears throat> so does every time yeah. that laughter helps somebody, is that Yahweh? Say, like, with my, my, my experience with the television show from yesterday, or yesterday, the day before yesterday, whatever it was. That does, and I feel much better, I'm happier, you know, I had my half a day of me, oh. and, and I'm great now. So, was that Yahweh using this, this very uh, blasphemous television show to make me feel better? <laughs> <laughs> ask, him when you get, ask him when you get to heaven. Uh, I, I, um... <laughs> That's a cop out, isn't it? Yeah, well. I, I think our funny bone <laughs> is a that. God-given gift. Uh-huh. <laughs> so the funny bone is a God-given I, gift. Gotcha. Yeah, I really do. I mean, you know, this this ability to laugh in the face of of difficulty intrigues me. Hmm. My wife, um, she deals with epilepsy, so I've seen hmm. her probably have a thousand seizures. Um, Sorry, that's that's tough. She also deals with. Um, Huntington's disease in her family. So she's lost three siblings. We actually lost five immediate family members in one year. Holy cow. And so, you know, so my laughter doesn't come from a place of this trite little ha-ha-ha. It, it has gotten me through, Mike. I, I don't know where I would be. Um, you described it well when you're saying, you know, you, you watch this show, and by the end of it, you're, you're cheered up. Mm-hmm. And uh, I get that kind of response from so many people, too many people for me to put it aside and say, yeah, well, whatever. Right. No, I, I think, um, hmm. you know, God has given us richly all things to enjoy, including um, absolute hilarity. And um, so I don't recommend, you know, necessarily going to crude shows to experience <laughs> that hilarity. I think... <laughs> I, I think, you know, often, see, I speak to se- what we would call secular groups, and I sometimes I don't even mention my faith. Afterwards, they'll come up to me and they'll go, so, I remember, just re- not so long ago, a guy just says to me, so, you, like, I just laughed for an hour, hmm. and you didn't even cuss once. And I said, oh, I guess I didn't. You oh, know? Yeah, and so you we don't need to, talk. absolutely, there's different kinds of humor, for sure, uh, and, and yeah. Everybody has their own own pr- preference and whatnot. But I, I can watch a, a cartoon or something, same thing, laugh, be in a better mood. It just happened to be this one was a, a very blasphemous television show uh, about God. Uh, Steve Buscemi, God, hilarious. Anyways, I can't stop laughing about it. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. So is there anything in the... We're going to go off here a little bit, but is there anything in the Bible that you find troublesome or that you struggle with? Oh, man. Hmm. I think if, if, if you're reading the Bible and things don't trouble you, then you've got problems. Um, what do you mean by that? God is... I, I, I mean that um, we like to put God in a certain box. I mean, I, I've just, um, I just finished reading relatively early in the Bible where you've got these wars going on, and so we mm. look at it and think, well, how in the world could God condone you know, violence and killing? Mm. Um, I, I think that I'm just beginning to, you know, like a kindergarten trying, a guy in kindergarten trying to spell things with the blocks. Um, I'm, I, I'm an infant, though. I've walked with God a very long time, but I, in understanding his ways, um, I, I think any God that I can understand totally is is a pretty small God that maybe wouldn't be worthy of my worship. So 
uh, to answer hmm. the question. I mean, I, you know, I mentioned to you earlier, I, I'm not a theologian. Yeah. I, I just am not. So, um, you know, I'm more one who tries to encourage others to build them up, to make them laugh, to tell them, hey, you know what, we, we've seen some hard times and we're finding joy despite that. Um, so that intrigues me, and I think, you know, the most important thing I, when I'm talking with people who have great problems with Scripture is to, you know, to point to Jesus and to point to the resurrection and say, well, start there. Don't start with all the problem areas that you can find, and we're very big into that in our age. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I have atheist friends who just basically mock me um, at certain points and say, you know, how in the world could you believe in a God that does this and does that? And I say, well, I, I think, you know, I can believe in a God who has done remarkable things in my own life um, in, you know, bringing a, a... I've said of my father, he was part scotch and part club soda, <laughs> um, because he was, and somehow, you know, yeah. how, how do you explain that this man's life was absolutely transformed, hmm. and as a result, his children and many grandchildren? Um, well, he was could be a lot of factors. There's a lot of factors. Uh, sorry? I mean, there's a lot of factors when it comes yeah. to somebody changing uh, who they are and, and their habits and stuff like that. You know, th there's a lot of things that tie into it. Uh, I, I can't point to one thing that has... Um, guided me in a different direction in my life it, it's usually a number of things and a process that takes a while right. you know it, it right. or some things i'll wake up in the morning and go well that was stupid i won't do that again you know th stuff like yeah. that but in in the end right yeah so you yeah. mentioned that yeah but i think you know to use my father as an example you would have to talk with him yeah well. and what he would <laughs> tell you and what he did tell me was uh apart from Christ and a relationship with God, hmm. um, he wouldn't have lived. Well, that's it, the it, direction he was headed. Yeah, I'm sure he'd say that. But I mean, again, he doesn't know for sure because he didn't try the other deities. He didn't try other medicines. He didn't try other uh, support groups. He didn't try all of that, you know. But this one did work, and you know, there he is, and, that, and that's that's good. At least he stopped drinking, and if that was the goal. Uh, but you did mention that Jesus. You want to point to Jesus mainly, and I, I kind of want to g go on that a little bit. Um, who is Jesus to you, and do you think he was like this perfect guy? Yeah, I you know I come from a, a standpoint of um, reading the story of Jesus in the Gospels, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I'm one of those fanatics that has fallen for that, um, mm -hmm. and. So, yeah, I, you know, I would say, yes, he's, he was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. So is that, and that's, like, okay, so I, when I read the Gospels, I read things such as the time he cursed the fig tree, <clears throat> pardon me, f cursed the fig tree for being out of season, which was cruel and unusual for no reason, or, or the time in Luke uh, 14 where he tells you that you have to hate your kids, hate your family, and, and all of these things if you want to be a disciple of him. Uh, and then at the end, and what's, gonna ha what's gonna happen at the end of the world? Jesus is gonna come back and take all the non-believers, all the sinful people, and uh, destroy them, throw them in hell, set fire to the earth. I mean, yeah, there's some happy, shiny Jesus in there, but there's also wrathful, angry, um, deadly <laughs> Jesus in there as well. And you and you have to take both together. You can't be a perfect, loving, awesome dude, but come back and set fire to people that don't love him. That doesn't really add up. Yeah. I mean, would would well, you let your kids uh, hang out with somebody who did all those things? Who said that they would uh, come would back and set fire to the <laughs> earth? <laughs> I'm going to come back and set fire to the earth. Or, yeah, curse a fig tree and, and, and make it go because it's out of season. Or, or turn over the change the, the tables in the, uh, the the temples. There's a lot of things he did that weren't just so peaceful and awesome. You know. Yeah. Well, I, you know, again, you're, um, I, I think you're probably, as I mentioned to you, I'm not a theologian. Uh, right, well, you said so, you studied the Gospels. I'm sorry, I, th I thought you had read these, these stories. Oh, I've read them, 
Yes, okay. I, I read them. I do. Yeah. And I, you know, so I, I believe. I'm a believer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have no other explanation for the fact that if, if you were to hang out with our family and watch what happens when, you know, these siblings one after another pass away, you would look at it and say, well, what kind of God allows that? Hmm. I would say, what kind of uh, world we live in? I would talk about that. This is where, you know... I would go to management. Is. Management's in charge. I would, I would right up to management. Let's go <laughs> well, talk to Well, what does them. management do? Fix everything? Well, and management... make it a perfect world? Well, it'd be nice if we started with with, with something, or or, or had a way to, a way for him to communicate and tell us how to make it better. That'd be cool. How to make what better? The world, the world. I mean, if if he wants it a well, certain, I, we know that there are different things we can be doing, which is what I have watched this family do: hmm. loving others, hmm. making a difference in people's lives. Um, you know, the joy that they have brought. I think of of Jim. Uh, my brother-in-law, who nursed his wife for 25 years through this thing and Mm. had countless opportunities to help others who are dealing with difficulty. And that's one of the things that's happened with us, is this has opened the door to encouraging others, to helping them in their difficulties. And that's where I struggle. uh, This thing... Yeah. That that's where I struggle. If Yahweh is going to set up all of this just to to help somebody feel better, somebody has to suffer and die to to help somebody feel better. I don't see how how that is a loving act or or logical in any way. There's so many other ways we can do these things. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to want to have people suffer to teach a lesson to well, to help other he people. Did. I think when Jesus suffering. came, what was he constantly doing? He was healing people. Well, it was not constantly. his plan. Yeah. It was, pardon me? It, I said, it was not constantly, his plan. He was, yeah. It, it, just about every time you, you deal with a story, there is healing in it. Mm. And, and often this is what's happening. So, you know, I don't look at it as saying this is some vindictive God up in the sky saying, I want to, you know, I, I'm going to make these people pay. No. Uh, he came mm-hmm. that we might have life, it says. And you see that him giving life to people, uh, or handful. Them. Well, yeah, he if yeah, if it's well, yeah, not handful. always recorded that he did. Yeah, well, you even know, if you it, know, it's it just a, a handful. Yeah, you had, you had thousands of people coming to to hear him speak to see what he does, and you knew uh, in a number of places it talks about him healing a lot of people. So there were people healed, um, and, and were later told that that, you know, not all the acts were recorded. There would not be enough room oh, yeah. to record it. <laughs> that's that's so, quite a statement, but, you, know. <laughs> you know. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. There's, there's hyperbole and irony in some of these things, of course. Yeah, and, yeah, and you got to figure out how to decipher between the two, you know. Did this donkey talk, yeah. or is this just telling me a fancy story, right? Yeah. So Jesus did miracles. You believe he did miracles. Do you believe that we, as as people, are able to perform the same miracles? I think he says it in Mark at the end there that uh, the believers will be able to. Yeah, well, there it is. Mark sixteen seventeen, and the signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands and drink deadly poison, and it will not hurt them at all. Uh, they will place their hands on the sick people, and they will get well. So, do do you believe that? Yeah, interesting. I think if you'd asked me that about six years ago, Hmm. I might have had a very different response. Hmm. Um, And what it took for me was having a son who was incredibly sick, Hmm. and we were going to lose him. And suddenly, and and again, you know, I'm telling you something that you can absolutely doubt and poke holes in, Hmm. but he transformed my theology when I saw what happened. And that was that... um, as I sat on a sofa with him, he told me the story of basically having an experience with God. The, the, what was eating his guts out after being uh, working with street kids in Uganda for a long time. He came home very sick for about three years. And then suddenly, boom, this is gone. And his explanation, of course, was, this was God's healing. 
Hmm. He then began to go, and I, I'm telling you, I'll just tell you what happened, um, yeah. because I'm a skeptic too. I'm a writer. I'm, I'm going, hmm. hey, what? I say, where did you go on the weekend? He tells me about going, oh, I just went to the city nearby, um, an hour away. What did you do? Well, I got just talking to people on the street. What do you do? Well, I just tell people that I, I'd like to pray for them, and I will tell them, God, Jesus of Nazareth, speaks to me, and I get the feeling with you, I have this impression, tell me if I'm wrong, but something is horribly wrong with your elbow, or whatever it is, with your kidneys. <laughs> Hmm. And I, you know, here's my son telling me this. I'm going, are you out of your mind? Mm -hmm. He says there was never a time when somebody doesn't say that's absolutely true. And Stephen said, that is not of me. That's from God. Can I just pray for you? It would have been a lot better if he he went to like a children's hospital and started helping those those people. And I'm curious, why doesn't the prayer work for everybody? Absolutely. You know, I if we've not, got this, if we've got Jesus not. saying the sick will place, or they will place their hands on the sick and they will get well. In other places, he says, whatever you ask for in prayer, uh, you will, it, it'll happen. Um, right. So it's just, it's just very curious yeah. to me that it doesn't work all the time and that nobody ever goes and visits a children's hospital to go save the kids that are sitting there dying. That just baffles me. I mean, you've got this great power, yeah. you know, I don't know. Great power comes well, great responsibility, man. Done, <laughs> he has definitely done some of that. He's had three children of his own, four children of his own in the meantime, so he's with them yeah. now. But, yeah, you know, I and listen, I, for me to say that faith is not shrouded in a fair amount of mystery would be an absolute lie, because it is. Hmm. We live in this tension of mystery, and that's okay. Um, I believe that you can. And uh, certainly, you know, you think I... I love to see these people whom I love suffering of Huntington's disease. You think I wouldn't like to see my wife's seizures? Yeah, yeah. Uh, We've prayed, right? She thankfully is doing much better now, Mike. But, Hmm. um, yeah, it's a mystery, things that we will know. uh, But we see through a glass darkly, and it's, it's not easy. Why does why does Yahweh like mystery so much? Why does he why does he hide and and stay quiet and and and, Mike, and keep know, things I mysterious? You, I am the last guy you want to talk to. Somebody, <laughs> about somebody. I want to know I what am, you believe. Really, I just want to know what you're you talking believe to about a this. comedian. <laughs> who, you know, I I read the Bible. Mm. I I'm not an expert. Right, um, I mean, you believe this so stuff, don't confuse though. Me you know, someone who is. It's all in there, though. It's all part of the belief. Sorry, it's what? It's all in there. It's all part of the belief, you know? I, I want to know how you, how this works for you as a believer. I'm not asking you to solve the mysteries of the universe. <laughs> I just want to know how that works for you. Because God's so mysterious. God's so, you know, not there. You know, how, how does that work for you? How do you reconcile that with reason and logic and, and common sense? I don't, I don't know. How do I reconcile what what part you're just saying the mystery the mysterious of it. parts the mysterious parts of Yahweh why he's still mysterious why he hides why he doesn't come down and say hello well if you read early on and uh, you know you got him doing exactly that during there's the no cameras though there's no Didn't cameras so we can't very well. these people could barely even read and write. So, and, and we've got so many contradictions, and, 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 and you even say to yourself, at your tough time with the, the Old Testament wars, there is a lot of really horrible things in there that God claims to do. And if God didn't do it, why would he allow, allow that in his book to make him look so bad? Just come down, explain it all to us, let's figure it out. I mean, it, why all the mystery? And, and I don't know, man. I wouldn't be okay with that. I'm just saying. I, if I've got this this belief, I'd like to have less mystery before I start believing it. Does that make sense? I think it does. To me, I think if I were in your shoes, um, and, and I don't know how much of this is, is just questions that you want to poke or, or what, but I, hmm. I would want to know very much how someone goes through things that are 
you know, I mean, there, there are so many cliches we use, like, um, God will never give you anything more than you can handle, which is hmm. absolutely preposterous. <laughs> it, it is not Good. biblical. <laughs> uh, it's not. So, you know, I have had more than I can handle for a lot of years. Hmm. And the only answers that I have found that make any sense at all to me is that God loves me hmm. and has made a way for me to spend eternity with him. And that gives me hope, you would call it perhaps, and, and other friends call that delusional, you know. I, would, I wouldn't um, call it delusional. You know, it's high in the sky. Um, it, it is kind of reaching. For me, I would go there. Sorry, I missed that. So no, I wouldn't call it delusional. I would say you're, you're you're kind of reaching and putting things together that aren't really there. But that's that's as far as I would I wouldn't I hundred percent never call you delusional. No. But I've you know I've just I've seen enough hardship in my life. I, I'm not talking about children in a hospital, children you don't know. I've been there too. Hmm. Um, you know I've lost my parents um, after Alzheimer's and dementia. That is a mystery. Mike, I cannot explain it. I had hmm. talks with God about that, um, and they were one-sided. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm just going like, what? Here's a guy, my dad, who has, you know, he served you faithfully for all these years. After coming to you, he was a fantastic guy. My mom was severely hmm. abused uh, for much of her childhood, sexually abused. Hmm. And she turned into, you know, this is another story of someone who turned the very worst thing in her life into something where every Tuesday night, I didn't even know what they were doing, but these ladies would come to our house, they'd hang out, sit in the living room, and I'd hear them crying, and I'd go out and play football, I'd come back, I'd hear them laughing. And after my mom passed away, I began to discover from receiving actual letters from them um, and, you know, face to face talks with me saying your mother took that worst thing in her life and transformed it she would say by god's help uh into the very thing that could help others and so she mm. she had all these 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 ladies in her life who who were again i believe transformed by god i don't i don't see you know maybe this is happening happening you're familiar with it happening mm. in other faith systems but god in our case changed our family and so i think you know going through alzheimer's with both of them uh caused me to ask questions that were very uncomfortable for me mm -hmm. i didn't want to ask questions but you know faith doesn't come without a lot of soul searching in my case yeah. And, and a lot of looking around and saying, well, what's the deal with that? You know, what kind of God would allow this guy to go through dementia where, where suddenly I can't have a conversation with my dad or with my mom? Um, so these tough, are hard right? things, and we yeah. do live in a mystery. We just do. do. Do you think that's worth it, though? I mean, what, what did you have to go through all of these things? Did your family members have to go through all of these things? It's, it's very horrible. Like, I just go with your mother, all the all the abuse when she grew up. Do, do you think it was worth it in the end? To, to Oh, man, I don't know, man. That just, it seems very, why would Yahweh choose to do things that way? Could he not just give your mother a good heart so she can help people? Why did she have to go through that situation in order to help people? Same with you. I mean, you could have found yeah, laughter without having asking, to do all of that. I mean, that just doesn't seem very loving and, and just to me. Well, I wouldn't say that God did that. And that's, you know, I, I was golfing with a guy the other day who was on me about, hmm. you know, how could God allow this woman to do what she did to me? Hmm. And we had had this conversation before. I, I took a swing and shanked one way off into the, out past the creek and into, you know, the woods. And I said, oh, how could God do that to me? And, you know, the truth is, I did it. Hmm. Um and that we live in a sinful, wow. fallen world no. where these things happen. And, to, you know, oh, did God, God cause my mother to be abused? No. Could did your mother cause it? it? I believe he could have. 
Your no, mother didn't cause it either. Who, who's in charge? Who's, who's in charge not, of this but mess? I, I can tell you exactly who did mm. by name, you know? Mm. Yeah. So I know who did it. And, and that's a an wicked, awful, awful thing. And somehow, I believe by God's grace, my mother was able to see that transformed. She was a, an awesome person whom you would very much love hmm. and appreciate and admire. Um, that's the kind of gal she was. So, hmm. yeah, again, you know, we live in these mysteries, but I have seen too much uh, where lives have been absolutely transformed hmm. to not, you know, to, to I, I, you know, again, these guys, my brothers-in-law that have loved you know, one one of them told me after nursing his wife, get this, 25 years with Huntington's disease, the day before she died, he phoned me. He said, she let me hold her hand today. Hmm. I said, what are you saying? He said, she didn't let me touch her for years. He was the principal caregiver. Um, these are hard things. In yeah. the midst of this, this guy aches. In the midst of this, in holding on to Jesus, he would tell you, that has kept me sane. Does he understand everything? Absolutely not. <sighs> Does he love God? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's like it's kind of like a placebo. Um, it makes you feel better. It gives you a hope. But in the end, man, that's tough, man. That, <laughs> that is tough. You've been through a lot, and I, I, um, I empathize with you, man. I, I, I apologize that you had to do all that. And if, if I was God, I would definitely find a better way without suffering or death involved to teach people lessons and to help other people. It just, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me and I'm just a human being and what do I know? But that doesn't sound very loving or helpful. So I, my atheist friend, Frank hmm. said these words to me. We were at a Eagles concert and, uh, Joel Walsh played, uh, amazing grace on the guitar. Hmm. Frank, my atheist friend, knew all the words and sang along. It was mm -hmm. it was kind of a cool moment. But he said to me afterwards, he said to me, you know, um, that foreigner song, I want to know what love is, he says, that's one of my favorite songs. But he said, after hanging out with you guys and seeing your, your wife have a seizure and seeing what goes on in your life, he said, that's my song, I want to know what love is. And it was later that mm. Frank came to a place of saying, I, I believe the only place I can find that love is in Jesus. That's and, so weird, uh, though. He embraced like, it. Like, so well, you embrace, it, it he doesn't so embrace you. you. But when you see someone who is going through hell and mm. finding a way to find joy, how do you explain that? That's placebo? Yeah. Uh, I yeah, would I say think they're using it. not. As a placebo, no, there is a, hmm. a deep-seated peace in my life, Mike. Where does that come from? Because I'm delusional? I, I did don't not know. So. No. It comes from me not knowing what the next hour brings, if my wife is going to have a seizure. But it comes from a place of gratitude, of me hmm. saying, but I'm here. If she <sighs> has one now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off the phone, and I'm going to be in there. Yeah, no. And over and over, I can remember sitting there with her when she was having one and thanking God. This, now, this will sound crazy to you. Thank you, God, that I'm here, hmm. because sometimes I've not been. And so for right now, I will embrace that, and I will focus on things that are pure and lovely and a good report. And, uh, you know, that's yeah. just that's hmm. been my life the last 20 or so years. And... Right. Uh, Right. It's tough, man. It's been that's, all right. That's it's tough. been okay. Yeah. First, yeah. Th I'm going to throw this verse out there. First, that's the first. That's I, I can speak. First, Thessalonians. <laughs> there it is Thessalonians five eighteen. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is Yahweh's will for you. Right there. That is that's horrible. That I cannot justify actions such as these. And give thanks. I just. I can't, man. I'll let you have the last word here. We're pretty much out of time, though, but uh, I'll let you have the last word. Oh, oh man. Thanks for the time together. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know what to say. You know, I, I think joy grows best in the soil of Thanksgiving, and that's where I've been for a very long time, and I would recommend it to anyone listening. <laughs> um, you know, I, 
I think it all, for me, faith centers on, uh, is it true? And mm. I can't prove it to you. Mm. But I do know the peace that I have in my life as a result of, of walking with Jesus, stumbling with Jesus, not always understanding, um, has been the thing that's transformed me. When my son was five, we were mm. going past the graveyard, he pointed out the ground, there was a pile of, or uh, out the window, there was a pile of dirt beside this big open hole, and he said, Dad, look, one got out, <laughs> and uh, I kind of found that funny. <laughs> but I got thinking about it and thought, well, that's my hope, is that one got out, that Jesus of Nazareth is, is risen, that he defeated death and promised new life. And, mm. and it's been, you know, despite all the crud we've been through, mm. been a, an incredible life, and uh, um, so I'm very thankful. All right, Phil. I appreciate your time and your answers, and 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 stay safe out there, man. You too, man. Stay thankful. Talk to you. Stay in there. All right. And that's all the podcast there is for you today. Thanks for listening. In case you missed the announcement at the start of the show, the t-shirt giveaway is still ongoing. Once the show reaches 25 patrons, I will pick a patron at random and send them a Bible Says What t-shirt. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash BSW the podcast and sign up to be a supporter of the show. Your episodic tithes of a dollar or more will give you a chance to win prizes, gain early access to each episode, listen to unaired conversations, unlock the patron feed, and much more. Thanks to the cosmic powers of the internet, it is now possible to buy me a beer or coffee online. Simply go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash BSW the podcast and click the appropriate buttons. If you can't support the show monetarily, please like, share, and or leave a review. As always, you can find me at the Bible Says What Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Instagram pages. You can also reach me at bswthepodcast at gmail.com. And no matter which platform you use to listen to your podcasts, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss out on the next episode. Until then, would you kindly pick up your Bibles and read them? <laughs> <laughs>